Who do you get your news from during this pandemic? Do you even trust the news that you're getting? Are you clicking your way through social media or are you keeping it old school? The misinformation is swirling online and a new report today points to overwhelming whiteness on our television screens. Does it really reflect Australia? Does it really reflect you? You've got loads of questions tonight, so let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hey there, good evening, welcome to the program. Joining me on the panel tonight, Nationals member for New England and the former Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce. Shadow Minister for Communications, Michelle Rowland, is also here. The author and columnist for The Australian, Nikki Sava, is joining us remotely. Hip-hop artist Z Ramu, who is also performing live for you later. Senior reporter at The Ten Network and Director of Media Diversity Australia, Antoinette Latouf. And a little later in the show, we'll hear from Sinead Boucher, who's the CEO of Stuff. It's New Zealand's most popular news site, but it's doing something pretty incredible. Please make all of them feel welcome. Uh, remember, as always, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag. Every week, uh, we ask our panellists to keep their contributions to the debate respectful. And we do ask that of you at home as well. So please, if you are on social media, keep that in mind. Our first question tonight comes from Anahar Karimi in the studio. As a person who loves public speaking and debating, when I watch the news, I never see anybody who looks like me. I've always wanted to be a journalist and the problem is I don't think that Australia would be able to accept someone like me. Do you think that there is a chance in the near future that Australians would be accepting of somebody who is a hijabi journalist like me on their TV screens? Antoinette. I believe you absolutely have a place on our TV screens and I see Dad is with you. That's amazing, because when I wanted to be a journalist, my dad told me to be a hairdresser instead. Um, so it's amazing that dad is here to support you. Look, there's no doubt there's a long way to go in terms of our newsrooms being inclusive. Um, I've worked alongside some trainees or people doing internships who wear hijabs. Um, I haven't seen them return to television, um, especially not in the, in the commercial world. Um, I believe um, in Canada, for example, and also in New Zealand, we have seen uh, women, Islamic women, um, with headscarves on primetime television. But what our report has found is that Australia has a, a pretty long way to go in terms of catching up um, with uh, other Western democracies similar to ours. But you're in year eight, is that correct? So you've got a few years to go. Hopefully by then, um, change is slow, but it's happening. And I hope for your sake, but also for audiences who should hear perspective like yours, percep perspectives like yours, uh, that our newsroom newsrooms are more inclusive. What have you actually found, though, in your report? What have you found in the Australian media landscape yes. and what's the actual problem? So what we have found, and some will say it's the uh, a pretty obvious observation, um, that our television screens are overwhelmingly white. So our research looked at television news and current affairs specifically. So every program from, from your breakfast television programs right through to Q&A, and it looked at who was presenting, reporting, um, and who was commentating on these programs. And it compared the cultural diversity makeup to the Australian population. That was one component. We also looked at editorial leaders, so what the boards look like, what state directors, uh, news directors uh, look like, as well as a survey of attitudes of people in newsrooms and then interviews with newsroom leaders. So what it found uh, on our screens, uh, around 75% uh, are of an Anglo background. And when it comes to Indigenous and diverse Australians, less than 6%, even though we amount to about... Um, so non-European, uh, we amount to about 25% of the population. So hugely underrepresented um, at kind of a face, at the face value of when you switch on your television. Uh, but the management was even more monolithic across all of the networks. So 100% of news directors in Australia are Anglo male, national news so, directors. So, but what does this do to the way Australia is reflected back to itself? Well, obviously, it has a trickle-down effect on which stories are told, how they're framed, how they're, which stories are selected, the voices that are put forward. Too often we see on all the networks, including the ABC, which we saw insiders after the Black Lives Matter protests, panels which are 100% white, commenting on issues that affect multicultural Australia, commenting on refugees, commenting on Black Lives Matter protests, commenting on immigration policy, and as I... As I 
I guess I liken it to a cooking show. You wouldn't have a cooking show and a panel of experts where no one is a chef or no one knows how to cook. But for some reason, when it comes to news and current affairs, we think it's acceptable to not have diverse voices. So I believe that really limits public discourse. Audiences are missing out. But, uh, Barnaby, what do you think? Um, well, first of all, congratulations. And I believe that Australia is an evolving place and you, you, you're going to have a future if you want it. It's that egalitarian nature for Australia. I don't think, to be quite frank, and I'm from the country, I don't think people give a toss what you wear. Uh, they give a toss about what you say. And... Um, they want to see balance. Uh, if if I, what I'd be looking for, if you're on the ABC, I'd say, okay, I want to see as many right wing commentators as I see left wing commentators. I'm really interested in getting that challenge of views, those challenge of ideas, the proper debate, rather than seeing a sort of a suite of people where I listen to one and I go, and here goes all the rest saying exactly the same thing. That is what really annoys me. Um, yep. What you wear and what your colour is is completely irrelevant. I'm red. What? How many of those do we have on television? <laughs> Look, Barbara, I'd agree with you, and I'd argue that more diversity would lead to more diversity of opinions, like just amongst um, our members. So we've got a National Committee, a Victorian Committee, a Queensland Committee. We've got a real diversity of opinion. And we have um, a lot of conservative views, a lot of religious views. And what I found, um, particularly in light of sort of the same-sex marriage plebiscite and the discussion that was had, to me, it was no surprise that the two LGAs in Australia with the highest no vote um, were Western South Sydney. Western Sydney and Western Sydney, but that's where yeah. I grew up. They were the conversations I had, was yeah. having with relatives who were incredibly religious, who were incredibly co close yeah, to their right. cultures. And they don't want to be belittled by their views. They don't want to be able to go on and say, well, now I have to completely comply with the views of the zeitgeist. Yep. They want to feel that uh, I'm entitled to these views, mm -hmm. I'm allowed to express these views, and especially on things like a public broadcaster. Absolutely. It's very and important. On a, on a, a private uh, organisation, well, they've got to make advertising revenue. And so, um, and you've both worked in them. If they don't make advertising revenue, they, they won't be there, no matter what colour people are. Michelle Rowland, do you think, actually, the media does have a responsibility to reflect the population more? I mean, there's been pretty strong pushback to Antoinette's research or the group's research today, news directors from the commercial network saying it's faulty research, it ignores the work of people like Brooke Boney on the Today program uh, and that they are making advances. Where do you sit on this? Well, the media has an absolutely vital role to play in terms of reflecting our character, our culture and our identity. And that's not just me saying that. That is actually the law saying that. Uh, that is one of the objects of the Broadcasting <coughs> Services Act. And whilst technology may change and whilst society may evolve, that principle uh, remains uh, very much constant. And I must say for our guest here, uh, I say in all sincerity, I have absolute confidence that you are going to achieve your dreams. Uh, you are one of those people whom I have the absolute privilege to visit when I am able to go uh, to schools in my electorate in Western Sydney who tell me what they want to do. They are articulate and they are driven. And I have no doubt that you are going to uh, achieve your ambitions. And also, but Just, just I think... on that, I mean, this is all lovely mm -hmm. and very positive in terms of the, re the reinforcing message. The, the director of news at the Seven Network, Craig Mc McPherson, responded to all of this data today saying... Uh, that the reason they don't have more diversity uh, is that uh, these people are not applying. Well, well, sorry to jump in, but I think what is so interesting about that, so from an Indigenous male, right, I have as likely of a chance of being incarcerated than I do from finishing high school. So if these networks are putting money into university scholarships and that's the avenue in which we're going to be represented within the media, but half of us are being locked up, then how is that going to support cultural diversity? How is that actually building infrastructure that's going to give you a platform when the systems in which we are to be able to achieve that platform, we're not even represented within, you know? And, and, and I think what's really interesting about what Channel 9 said about Brooke, for example, she's one of four on this show, right? If she... Or on the Today Show. On the Today, Today Show. That. If she is one of four, she can only speak on her lived experience. So she can't represent all minorities. So having one is not cultural diversity. Mm. And then on top of that, is it cultural diversity or is it performative cultural diversity? Because for example, on, on this show today, the song that I'm gonna perform is called Stand For Something. The song I initially was gonna perform uh, was called April 25th. Um, and this is a song 
that I was not allowed to perform. Like I, I was basically censored in, in the fact that the ABC said that it was not appropriate. Um, so is it performative? Because me sitting on this panel ticks off a box for the ABC that is cultural diversity, but if I'm not able to express my perspective, is it performative or is it actual cultural diversity? Because as yeah. Barnaby said, it's important that we have freedom of speech and freedom of expression. So if we have seats at the table, but then we are not able to express our lived experience, are we actually having cultural diversity or is it performative? We'll have to go to the bat for the ABC here. Um, it all. Uh, I imagine when you say April 25th, we're, um, we're what, we're looking at Anzac Day or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, yeah, you, look, you, I don't know. Just, just don't know to be clear, lyrics, I, th I think it's worth shedding a little bit of light on this. The, the lyrics include the line, I hate the Anzacs. It's repeated and there's a lot of context which we did want to talk to you mm -hmm. about tonight to understand where that comes from. Uh, but without context, uh, there may be issues. So... Yeah, look, I, there's kind of... Look, I never thought I'd do this, defend the ABC. Mm -hmm. But here goes. Um, you got to be careful what you say. I mean, you go to a point where you insult people. What about, I could talk uh, Indigenous people where I grew up, um, you know, when I was out in St George, Lenny Waters, and uh, they, they, you know, these, there are so many Indigenous people who are part of the RSL movement, mm -hmm. and what are you saying to them? You know, what, we, how, how does that work? What do you say to all the people who are the members of North Force? What, do you, what are you saying to them? You, you don't respect their I, I think it's worth letting Ziggy explain <laughs> what he was saying well, and, and what the lyrics do refer to. So, my song April 25th comes from an academic theory, which is the black armband view of history. So, the whole point of the song April 25th, and this was the issue that I had with the censorship, is that in this song, I say, I hate black culture, I say, I hope black people die, I say, I hope that we tear down Indigenous culture. I say that about 20 times, right? And the whole reason of comparing Indigenous Australia and April 25th is the fact that, so I myself have gone to Belgium when I was 17. Uh, I went to the Scots College for my last three years on academic scholarship. And uh, Dr Aspinall is the principal and the founder of the Scots College, right? And his son, Robert Aspinall, died in service uh, in World War I. So I had the privilege to go there, right, and, and celebrate and understand the sacrifice that people have laid down for this country. So the whole point of a song about April 25th is saying that I've seen this country recognise the sacrifices that have been made so that we could all sit here today. So if I've seen us be able to do that for our non-Indigenous people and our Indigenous people, like yeah. you said, who fought in these wars in 1945 that the ABC is commemorating 75 years since the end of World War II, yet in 1945, Indigenous Australians weren't even classed as citizens. My father was born before 67. So my father wasn't even classed as a citizen when he was born. So the whole point of a song about April 25th, and as soon as I say, after I say I hate the Anzacs, I say, how wrong is that? How wrong is that? We pick and choose our history. We rearrange the facts. We fought for a country that didn't see us as humans. We weren't seen as humans in our own country. So the reason why I wanted to talk about this and in my art is that I want to celebrate the Anzacs and I do celebrate the Anzacs. I've gone to the other side of the world on Anzac Day to celebrate what our people have laid down for us. So if we've done that, we can't just pick parts of our history that we want to recognise and bury the others. If in World War II we fought against genocide, yet we don't recognise the genocide in our own country, that's a double standard. So the whole reason why the song says, I hate the Anzacs, is to demonstrate that how outrageous is that? So if we can recognise how outrageous that is, why can't we recognise that on January 26th? Why can't we recognise that when we asked to raise the, raise the age from 10, because 600 kids last, last year were locked up, right? And we're 2% of the population. We make up 65% of those kids incarcerated. That's 349. So if we can't recognise it then, 
Like, sure. do we not understand? And, and just to be clear, we did invite you on to <coughs> explain all of that context and explain the reasons behind your lyrics. So, uh, I just think that needs to be, that point needs to be made clear. Our next question tonight is from Bala Sugavana. Thanks, Hamish. As a brown Australian and a Tamil born in Chennai, India, where Kamala Harris's uh, mum was from, I was horrified to see the racist cartoons suggesting uh, racist tokenism uh, published in the Australian. It was even more disappointing to see the editor-in-chief uh, defending it. Um, on the surface level, it might seem like the lack of diversity in the Australian mainstream media is a problem, um, but isn't it more deep-rooted and complex than just that? So we're just looking at that image now. I'm interested to hear your response, Bala, because the editor of The Australian said the intention of the commentary in the cartoon was, in fact, to ridicule racism, not perpetuate it. Did, do you not find that plausible? I think when it says that little brown girls, that was taken out of context, and it's sort of like, you know, it, it's reductionist, and it says it perpetuates the same message that when a person of colour, when they... Uh, when they're successful, when they achieve something, it's not seen as based on merit. It's seen as, you know, based on um, tokenism. So, so just to be clear, in your view, the cartoon was racist? Yeah. OK, Nikki Sava. Um, look, I... That cartoon was based on something that Joe Biden had said. And he made the remark about little black girls and brown girls. And I have to say that when I heard him say that, I cringed. I think uh, Kamala Harris is an outstanding candidate. And uh, for so many reasons, uh, she's smart, she's tough, she's accomplished. And, um, you know, she, I think, would make a brilliant uh, vice president. But the things that uh, we should be focusing on are those characteristics, not the other things that, you know, people keep referring to, like gender, like race, like religion, um, like age, all of that. So I thought that uh, Biden had a poor choice of words there. I don't think he should have said that. But, but I to, think to, be, to be fair, he should have said he, he should have said that, that he way. had chosen the best candidate that he could find for the job, sure, and that was enough. I have Nikki Sava, just to be clear, he wasn't describing Kamala Harris that way. He referred to to young women that might be inspired to become a president or vice president because of her. Isn't it stretching reality somewhat to, to say that he described her that way? He, the, the cartoon was a sledge against Biden. It was not a sledge against Kamala Harris. I would say it was a sledge that's against That's how I Biden. saw it. When, when I saw that cartoon, that's how I took it, that he was having a go at Biden. Did, did you like take I it that say, way? When that? I heard Biden say it, I cringed. I don't believe... I think it was um, a swipe at both. Um, I don't think the little brown girls... Um, he wasn't using that to describe his running mate. He was using that to talk about the historic appointment and the fact that that will lead to little brown girls and little black girls going, I can do that because you, you can't be what you can't see. And I know, uh, for example, when I, when I was growing up um, and if I saw anybody diverse on television, that to me made me think, I can do that. Perhaps there's a way. Mm. Um, and so if we're talking about context, the context was a stretch. Um, I don't believe um, he was using the same words or using Biden's words. And I think it diminished um, Harris as a running mate. I think it, re it reduced her. Um, I, I mean, I don't think it's the most racist thing to come out of News Corp cartoons, um, but I think the doubling down of the editor-in-chief and sending a memo to all staff... Um, uh, rather than reflecting, this is where, and to your point, is this just about lack of diversity? No, but I think there's a component. Had there been more diverse people in that team, in that editorial leadership team, the conversation and reflection, I think, would have been different. I'm not saying bring down the, the cartoon. I'm not saying uh, stifle satire uh, and don't push boundaries, but I reckon there would be more reflection if it wasn't four white blokes going, hey, John, what do you think? Oh, I don't think it was racist. Peter, what do you think? And and Michael and Andrew, oh, we all we all agree. We all agree. Oh, so but it's just Barnaby? fine. Yeah, look, I, I don't know. Look, you, there, there's a special place for cartoons. I'm sure that The Guardian has absolutely smashed Trump at times. I'm sure CNN has absolutely smashed Trump at times. I'm sure the Fairfax media have given... You could 
bring out umpteen cartoons which uh, would take certain traits of but a person is there a place for on racism? the other side of the political field. Now, my view on the presidential race, if you haven't got a job, you should apply for President of the United States because that job's vacant. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I'm absolutely certain if Colin Powell stood, people would go, hooray. Mr. Wong, do, do, do you find that cartoon racist? I do. And I think the fact that uh, the editor needed to explain it yeah. uh, in such a way, almost like we had to be racist in order to expose racism, uh, I think uh, says it all. But also, I represent a, a community uh, where uh, half of my local residents were born overseas and the vast majority of those born overseas are from the subcontinent. And I don't need uh, talking points or you know, anyone else telling me what to think on this because I've actually received feedback um, from my own community. Uh, when that sort of language is said in that context, it's saying that about people's sisters, their daughters, their mothers. Mm. And your point, the point to merit is correct. Like, it actually doesn't speak uh, to the merit of someone who could very well be the 2IC to the leader of the free world. Um, and could, hey, be Michelle, the, could be the boss. Michelle, can I add, I've spoken to a lot of people, a lot of people of colour, and I've had mixed feedback as to whether they found it racist or not. Uh, but I would put to the Australian and to the editor of Chief if that when they say context is everything, well, I say context uh, within the Australian uh, in the context of Black Lives Matter matters uh, because I feel that the publication did its best to try and link the Victorian cluster to Black Lives Matter, even when the health authorities and the facts said the opposite clearly. So just a couple of weeks later, that cartoon being placed in a publication, um, for me, that context, that context matters, and I think that's also why so many people took issue with it. OK, our next question tonight is a video from Robert Kananzi in Essendon, Victoria. Hi, I'm Robert and I'm a Year 12 student in Melbourne. My question for the panel is, as somebody who is exposed to numerous online forms of media every day, I see journalists fight for their viewership through having the most groundbreaking article or catchy title. So I wonder where the line will be drawn between the right to know and an invasion of privacy. Moreover, who arbitrates as to what is in the public interest to report on and what prevents journalists from chasing a profit under the guise of the public interest? Hmm. Nikki Sava. Well, um, it's a very fine line at times, isn't it, between uh, the public's right to know and a person's right uh, to privacy. And um, I think uh, judgments have to be made almost every day uh, on these issues. And uh, sometimes uh, the media gets it wrong and other times um, it doesn't, you know. Who, who, holds the media right to to know. The, who holds the media to account when they do get it wrong? Is there any well, accountability? Uh, of course there is accountability. We have uh, law courts. Um, we have shows on the ABC that hold all sorts of um, outlets uh, to account. Uh, readership um, also. I mean, newspapers and TV and whoever relies on credibility, right? Credibility and trust. So if their readership believes that they're telling them things that they need to know and telling them in a fair way and an accurate way, then, of course, they will respond to that. And they will respond also if they think that they have been misled by the organisation. Yeah. So I, it's I all about credibility agree. and I trust. don't agree with you, Nikki. Um, look, I think that it's quite easy to draw the line, Nikki. If a person... Uh, is in the public view, that is paid for a job where they're in the public, you're in the public, you're paid for a job, I'm in the public, I'm paid for a job. But if a person is a private individual that is not paid, then they're not, it is not in the public interest. And it's all very well to say, oh, it's a fine line. It's not. It's a sell of paper, Nicky, be straight. And, you know, and people bend that line and say, oh, you can take them to court. No one's got pockets bigger than Murdoch. You're not going to take him to court for defamation. He'll keep you in court forever. Well, I, it, I it's, think it's we've not, had it's... quite a few defamation cases yeah, yeah, lately. Yeah. Actually, where unless, uh, you're that's... Really affl unless you're really affluent, unless you're really affluent, defamation, gonna... uh, defamation generally, the, the, those who are more, more litigious are politicians, um, people with deep pockets. So for the the average Australian, defamation of often isn't an avenue just because it's too costly. Yeah. That's correct. I, I know. Barnaby, I didn't think we'd agree so much tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki, I know you're trying to respond. 
Um, no, that, that that's fine. <laughs> um, look, my my sphere is is politics, right? And uh, we have. Um, uh, fights all the time between politicians and media about what should and shouldn't be published when it comes to politicians and uh, their private lives. And I think Barnaby is uh, maybe taking this um, a little bit personally. Uh, I'm not, Nikki. I'm just, I'm just saying the bleeding obvious. I'm a public figure. Go absolutely go after me. I, you're, you're allowed to do that. He's a public figure. And, Nikki, you're a public figure. But if you are just a private individual who's not actually paid for a public job and you think you can flog a newspaper by sticking them on the front page, well, you're having yourself on if you say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm more righteous than others. I mean, that, just call it for what it is and that's fair enough. And, you know, I'm going to call it out because I don't care. That's all in the past, what happened to me. But I don't want that to happen to somebody in the future. I think it's... Well, I, I, well, it's a I, I, I don't know what And it's what not, kind and it's of not about me. It's about, it's about a private individual walking across the road. You take a photo of a pregnant woman walking across the road, put it on the front page and give yourself a walkly. I mean, go... Come on. I, I think we probably just need to explain for the audience that hasn't followed every detail of all of this. You, you're speaking from personal experience yeah. here. You're, you're now, your partner was, was photographed and placed on the front page of a, a tabloid newspaper. Do you think, Michelle Rowland, that Barnaby Joyce has a right to be angry, frustrated, upset, um, even out for, for this publication, uh, given what they, they did? No, I can completely understand, actually, where Barnaby's coming from. And, I mean, I'm in the public eye as well. Uh, but uh, I put myself out there and the fact is that media scrutiny is the price that I pay for being a politician and serving a democracy and it, that's a price that I'm willing to pay. Um, in other cases, though, let's be very clear also, um, politicians always want to look like real people um, and we need the media as well um, for ourselves. And there are times when uh, we do seek out the media mm. in order to let people know we are actually human, uh, that uh, but, but we, also we do share you similar perhaps stories. perhaps use families in, in photo opportunities many, or... Man, many people do, and, and I've done that, but I have certain rules about the extent to which I did. And I'll give you a, a very personal example. Um, I've gone through um, a recent um, uh, wellness transformation, if you can call it that, um, and I was... Come on, boast, of the, boast about <laughs> it. <laughs> It is pretty remarkable. Oh, well, Barnaby didn't recognise me when he when he uh, no, wa walked in. But, uh, you know, it took a long time, but uh, I managed to significantly turn my um, health, my life uh, around and become uh, much fitter. And uh, I decided I would tell my story um, to um, Annika Smethurst. And uh, at first I was very unsure about it because uh, whilst politicians, you know, a lot of politicians are, are very cautious about how they come across, they don't want to look silly and, of course, uh, I, I didn't want that to happen to me either. Um, but I did feel comfortable after chatting to her about it that, you know what, we are living in really depressing times and this might actually give some people a bit of hope for what they can do because, look, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah, that, that, was, that was my whole, my whole uh, thing about, uh, about the whole um, article. Um, but, you know, once upon a time, privacy was the right to be left alone. Um, privacy cases were primarily that of... Um, they were in tort. They were about uh, lights uh, in people's backyard shining um, in, onto other people's verandas. Uh, these days, it's something extremely different. Uh, and when we talk about uh, privacy, we are talking about data collection, um, but we are also uh, talking about uh, exposing individuals. And it, it is a sad reality that in the last couple of years, we've had... Um, a recommendation for a tort of a serious invasion of privacy. Um, we've yeah. had the ACCC reaffirm that that's been called for, but nothing has happened. So until that happens, and you know, who knows whether um, that could have been argued um, in that case, but it certainly, um, at least I I'm guessing from your viewpoint, yeah. Barnaby, could I'll, have given I'll, a better avenue. I definitely would than... support a tort of privacy. And just to reaffirm, because I know they'll be out there, and the Twitterati, it's not about me. Uh, I'm a public figure. I put myself out as a public figure. You put yourself out as a public figure. You do, you do, you do now. You're on, on this show. But if I went after your partner or you had a partner mm -hmm. and I've just decided that that was a good yarn, I think that person has a right but to a tort of privacy. Barnaby, you had campaigned on family values. Well, go after me. Go after me. Go after me. But didn't that that's tell a us a different thing. story about those that's, values? That's, you go after me on that. You don't... If you've got a partner... I don't know who it is, right? 
But if I put your He's great. Part, He'd love okay, it. If, you, if I put your partner on the front page just because it's your partner, is that fair on him? No. Of course. Thank you. All right, let's take our next question. It's from Rita Jabri Markle from the Australian Muslim Advocacy Network. In a week's time, the Australian terrorist who murdered 51 New Zealand Muslim men, women and children will face sentencing. Australian research has shown that anti-Islam conspiracy theories uh, portraying Muslims as a subhuman, incompatible, uh, existential threat to society are now really common online and have been for many years, uh, and that it is a major gateway to right-wing extremism. This disinformation is often carried out by malicious third-party websites and amplified through social media platforms. We're really pleased the Australian government has announced a disinformation code, that it's doing one with the tech industry. Um, however, we would like to ask whether that code will focus on this particular type of harm and uh, if it doesn't work, what should the Australian government do further to protect Australia from the public harm of uh, disinformation? Ziggy. It's a really, I think, interesting question because, you know, everything that we're talking about, like within representation, within media and, and mainstream media, when I was growing up, I didn't see people like me in these spaces. So, you know, during my life, because I'm 25 now, uh, pretty big life, but um, the social media has been a way for me to be able to go to the primary source of marginalised communities and, and get representation from the primary source. So I think it's such a delicate balance between wanting to allow these uh, myself as a marginalised community to be able to share my story and my information in a space when I'm not often being represented in marginalised communities, but then also still having correct protocols to govern uh, and to, to stamp out this misinformation. But haven't these social media companies proved that they are incapable of actually doing that? Well, I because think they've that's... opened it up, everything is there. Yeah, and, and I think that's these next steps in, in what is really important in, in demonstrating that, yes, you are a free market in the sense that you are on the internet, but there still has to be protocols that are, are governed because if, if we are having... Just because it's on the internet, it doesn't mean we've, we've lost mm. all forms of society. Antoinette? Look, I think... Um... Trump has succeeded in, in one way, why he hasn't succeeded in navigating his, his country through this pandemic. He's succeeded in really undermining mainstream media and the credibility of mainstream media. Um, and, and, and for some outlets or some journalists, that criticism may be fair go. Um, a lot of people are relying on other sources online. Anybody with a camera who can sit behind a desk and with an editing app is putting things together. And we saw that during, uh, you know, we've seen that really escalating during COVID-19. So misinformation is one thing, Getting sharing something you haven't fact-checked, but the orchestrated disinformation is incredibly dangerous and mm. it's growing and the tech companies aren't um, keeping up with the flow of information. And I see otherwise, you know, intelligent, reasonable, nice people believing this stuff, this mm. hurtful, de mm. divisive stuff and sharing it. Um, yeah. And just as a journo, you know, I've been a reporter on the road for several years. Never have I copped so much abuse from randoms just for being yeah. the media. And I'm not doing anything, I'm just standing there. Fake news and, you know, defund the media and blah, blah, blah. There, there's so much hate and animosity towards the media and that makes those dis these disinformation networks that are really sophisticated a really dangerous but attractive alternative. Antoinette, we've got to try and almost give kids a course that... Yes, media Twitter, literacy. Twitter is the ambit scratchings on the back of a lavatory wall. It's <laughs> not, I think you might need to give it, kids it's, a lesson on what that means. <laughs> yeah. fair, you know, I, I need a lesson it, on what it's, that means. It's not... It's not media, but you know, if you want the most vile rubbish about you, then Twitter is the place to go. Uh, you know, I think I've got on about 100,000 followers on Twitter or something like that, I don't know. And about 99.9% .9 hate my guts. Okay. And, uh, so why are you there? Well, I don't read it. Other, <laughs> most of my staff do that stuff. So right. to, get, to get basic messages out. But what Twitter and Facebook and Google are doing is they're absolutely wrecking 
the, the other media stables because they're dragging all their advertising revenue off them Agreed. and they don't have a bureau in Canberra and they don't have mm. regional newspapers, but they do take the advertising revenue. I think um, Google uh, t basically wandered off to Singapore with about $4.8 billion mm. worth of, uh, of cash. They paid $100 million in tax. Whoopie do. Mm. I bet you they made more than that. And in the meantime... Uh, all your newspapers are going broke okay. in regional areas. Uh, we, I want to talk about this more, but I want to introduce someone else to the conversation right now. Sinead Boucher is in Wellington. She's the CEO of New Zealand Media Business. It's called Stuff. Now, Sinead was an executive at the company when the Australian media group, Nine Entertainment, was trying to offload it. She paid one Kiwi dollar and is now the CEO of one of New Zealand's biggest media organisations. Sinead, welcome to the program. Good evening, Hamish. It's nice to be here. Uh, how did that moment... Uh, shape the way your business uh, and you particularly see the social media platforms? Well, obviously that day in March last year um, in Christchurch was um, one of the worst days in New Zealand history, something we absolutely couldn't believe happened on our shores. And for our media business, I think the fact that that massacre was live streamed on Facebook um, was one of the more shocking elements of the day. Um, and it, it made us really assess our own relationship with Facebook, a platform that um, didn't seem to be too concerned about really putting its efforts into stamping out this kind of behaviour. I think the reality is if that happened again this week, the same sort of thing could be live streamed again. Um, so we made the decision then uh, to not advertise or pay Facebook um, for any, any services at all back then because we didn't want to be... Um, part of the problem by funding a platform that allowed that sort of um, content to be streamed. And that started actually what's sort of been a, a year-long process of us reassessing our whole relationship with the platforms, particularly Facebook, which culminated um, about six weeks ago with us withdrawing our content from Facebook altogether so we don't post anything there now. You're really being portrayed as this sort of tiny media business in the far corners of the earth that's taking on the tech giants. Is that actually what you're doing? Well, we don't see it as taking on the tech giants. What we um, do is see it as doing something that um, is true to the values we have as a company and the things that we want um, people to believe of us. Um, so we have set um, growth and public trust as the most important metric for us as a company. And we just felt that being part of a platform that allowed the live streaming of massacre, that allowed the spread of conspiracies, um, you know, fake news, hate speech, was just not compatible with what we wanted to achieve. I do want to sort of point out, though, that if you, if you speak to any of these companies, they will all point to their improvements in policies, the actions they are taking to actually stamp some of this stuff out. Are you saying that ultimately you just don't believe them? Um, yeah, I guess that is what I'm saying, uh, because I haven't seen any real evidence of mass change or a, a strong will to change. There's been lots of tinkering around the edges, the odd program here and there. But, um, you know, look at what's been happening even in the last sort of month or two, um, the spread of the COVID conspiracies, um, the uh, rise of the hate speech around a black, you know, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there isn't really any significant change now than there would have been a year ago. So um, I don't think enough has been done. I don't really think there is the will there to make the change. All right, our next question tonight comes from Andy Leach in Marrickville, New South Wales. There are multiple examples of big tech companies altering their algorithms, lowering the reach of content and having a devastating effect on online media outlets. What is to stop the big tech companies doing the same when the government brings in this new code? Essentially, instead of paying big media companies for their content, the tech firms just alter their algorithm and in turn lower the reach of the media content and killing off online media ad revenue. This is the point that the tech giants are making now, that they actually help your business or did when you associated with them. We have had a drop of audience. We were expecting that, but it's been in the low single digits um, and, uh, you know, hardly any page impressions have, have dropped at all. Um, a web question we've received tonight points to, to Google releasing an open letter today warning Australians that the way they use Google is at risk as a result of the news media bargaining code that we're talking about. 
Uh, why should large, this is a question, why should large news agencies be protected over and above Google when there's such a high concentration of private ownership for news in some questionable hands. Yeah, look, I think um, I have, I've, I've seen some of the comments that were related for, uh, released by Google today. Um, I think, you know, ultimately, the value that the journalism produced by companies like our own in New Zealand or, or our former owners, Nine, News Limited, adds enormously to the business models uh, and the um, experience that Google gives its um, customers, its, its readers, anyone using its products, the same for Facebook, etc. Um, it's hard to see uh, an argument where Google is somehow, um, you know, its business model is at risk by the fact that they might have to pay for some of the content or, or that reflects the value that that content has given their business models over the last sort of 10 years. Sinead Boucher, it's been delightful talking to you tonight and uh, uh, some unique insights uh, from across the ditch. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's take our next question tonight. It's a video from David Foster in Tamworth, New South Wales. Mr Joyce, you're my local member. I'm a, a member of the Tamworth community. And I'd like to know that you thought whether it might be possible to set up a virtual border around our region to protect our communities against the COVID-19 threat. This idea is no longer implausible. There are already communities within and outside major cities which are coming up with plans to isolate their towns and suburbs from the threat of the virus. Visitors and passers-by travelling from the many hotspots in Sydney and Victoria use the New England Highway. It's a, it's a thoroughfare for anybody passing through on their way to Brisbane or returning from Brisbane to Sydney. Tamworth is a very popular stopover. Do you have any ideas which could be Im implemented? All right, before we go to Barnaby Joyce, Nikki Sava, is this border issue getting away from the government a little bit now? Well, uh, we're breaking down into fiefdoms. Um, we're no longer one country. We're a whole collection of, you know, separate states and separate areas within those states. And I can understand uh, the fear of people in the present environment, but I don't see how that is going to help us uh, deal with this problem in the longer term. If everybody breaks down into little segregated uh, communities, I think that's a very um, dangerous and worrying development. And um, I think the Prime Minister needs to uh, take a much greater uh, hand in this, and he just seems to be a bit powerless at the moment. None of the premiers are listening to him on reopening borders. Um, people are wanting the borders to stay closed while ever the premiers think that they've got the voters on side, they're not going to open up. It's just, um, I think, isolationist and also a bit insulting. But, but, um, but isn't it protecting some lives? I mean, if you're in, on the border with Victoria, wouldn't you say that those border closures currently are doing a lot for you and probably for your business? Well, um, t to an extent, yes. But say um, in the ACT, we have no community transmission. Uh, we haven't had um, a case for weeks and weeks, weeks, and yet Anastasia Palaszczuk, because it's a popular thing, says no one from Canberra can go to Queensland. OK, fine, some of us don't want to go there. But I, I just think it's a populist measure by some of the premiers uh, to enhance their standing in the lead up to their elections. And um, I, I think um, they've just gone over the top. Barnaby, this was a question for you. Yeah, um, I think states in their current form are way past their use by date. They're probably relevant in 1901, but there's no way that North Queensland feels this, any affection towards Brisbane or central Queensland does. New England wanted its own state in 1967. I think it's it's brought to light a, a bigger issue and a bigger issue is that you hear everybody but no-one wants to say it because state politicians support state governments and state bureaucrats do. Well, the premiers are pretty popular at the moment. Yeah, but because they, 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 they're a necessity because you've got states. I, I think that uh, Australia has developed now into a vastly bigger place and greater representation in those specific regional areas should be allowed to be given. That's why I su suggested regional senators to try and give some voice to it. But um, So what about David's idea? If you close down, look, it's a balancing act. If you, first of all, there's no capacity for that to happen because uh, 
we're run from Sydney, which people in New England don't like. And the second thing is you've got to balance it off with tanking your economy. I think one of the big issues for Australia going forward is how on earth we repay this debt that we are mounting up. It is exponentially growing, as I said it would back in 2010. And whether we're in government or Michelle's, uh, the Labor Party are in government, the biggest issue in the future will be how on earth do we start paying this back? So you've got to be careful. Borders, your view, Michelle? Well, I think we should always take our advice from the medical officers in charge. And my understanding is that that is what the premiers and chief ministers have been doing. And I think the fact that uh, you know, Queensland and WA have seen what I understand to be a downward or a flattened, at least, trend uh, does demonstrate that the actions that they've taken, and in South Australia as well, the actions um, you know, that have been taken by various states uh, have, in fact, worked. And I also think that you know, it is incumbent on... Uh, Premiers and Chief Ministers. I mean, if they're part of... We've heard a lot about this National Cabinet. I think it's incumbent on them, but it's also incumbent on the Prime Minister to respect those views. And whilst I, I take Nikki's point that, you know, a lot of this is political, there are some tweets that will not age well, Hamish, about what some the actions that some of these Premiers and Chief Ministers have done, because they have done quite an effective job. In the meantime, uh, I think that, you know, my personal view is that we sh in New South Wales, we should be wearing um, masks as much as possible. I was walking down the main street of Blacktown today. A week ago, nearly everyone had a mask on. Today, very few people. So I don't know what has changed in um, people's psyche. Maybe they think that this is getting under control. Yes, Western Sydney is a big place, but there have been some really terrible clusters that have spread very quickly um, from specific spots. And that is what is worrying me. Ziggy, just to the borders question, I mean, for an artist who would normally, I assume, travel around the country all the time performing, uh, do you have a view as to whether you, you, you think the borders are right to be closed? Yeah, like, for me, my I, I'm an artist, but first and foremost, like, I always say I, I never want to be a better artist than I am a better person. And at a time where we are in a, in a pandemic, like, this is very serious. This isn't something to be taken lightly. I think it's very easy to be reactionary and, and you know, being angry and frustrated is, is totally understandable, but... It's hard to know what is the right thing to do in this specific moment because... But, but it looks different if you're in Queensland than if you're in the ACT where Nikki is, doesn't it? Exactly. And I think, you know, like, because you look at even outside of Australia how different countries have handled this. For example, Sweden has been going with herd immunity and, and there's been critiques of is, is that the correct way or is the way that we're doing it more correct going into a lockdown? And I think... It's, it's hard to say because we don't have hindsight. We're living in it right now. Do you like the Sweden approach? I think it's interesting. And, and again, it's hard to say, right, because we are living it right now. Um, I think for me, I don't... Obviously, for the music industry, it is decimating it and artists are feeling the impact of that. But personally, I, I see my responsibility as someone who will survive this if I get it. I'm not that susceptible and vulnerable. However, we do have vulnerable people within our community. So if you have the privilege, and I'm talking about you, you can stay inside, you have a roof to stay inside, you have running water to stay inside, you have access to food, then, then I think we have an obligation to, to exercise our means to do that. In, in saying that, I do think we do have to look at a bigger picture of, of Yes, there are these deaths that are going to be attributed to COVID, but what is further reaching than that? The, the rates of domestic violence and, and women who will be vulnerable because of these locks, net lockdowns, the rates of, of kids who are, are going to fall through the gaps of the education system. So knowing what is the exact right course is obviously tricky, and it, it just within Australia, within the States, you, you've seen different reactions, and, and I think we have to be on, on, on the same page, in a sense. Like, this is about us coming together as a country. All right, let's take our next question. It's a video from Alex Robinson in Armidale, Victoria. My question is to Barnaby Joyce. When you were the special drought envoy, you claimed to have sent an awful lot of reports to the PM. When asked for more information about this, you claimed you sent reports of the drought to the Prime Minister via text message. When asked to release these reports, your government refused. 
This is just one example of your coalition government not being truthful nor transparent with the Australian people. My question is, do you think Australians deserve better than this? This is a bit to deal with some of the points made there. Did you send the reports via text? Is that what happened? Uh, yeah, I've sent them in a, in a range of ways, in actual written reports and in yeah. text, and uh, I was continual uh, contact with the Prime Minister. And the reason I said that is people say, oh, you haven't sent a report. A lot of my reports, as you know, I talk pretty direct. Um, and yes. <laughs> maybe some people didn't want to read the directness without it all being redacted. I, I don't pull a punch when I'm trying to get issues through. And, um, you know, it's that's my correspondence is to the Prime Minister. Um, it was directly to the Prime Minister. And if the Prime Minister, like any other letter, decides that he doesn't want to put it out or have it uh, in the public forum, then that's his right. But I was just telling people the truth. I was, I was talking direct because I believe in that circumstances it's what the Prime Minister needed to hear. Michelle, should this sort of thing be made public? Do we have a right to know what Barnaby did as the drought envoy? Oh, I'd love to read what Barnaby did as the drought envo <laughs> envoy. And uh, I, I think this goes to a bigger issue of transparency. Um, I think particularly at a time when you know, Parliament is not meeting uh, as regularly uh, as, as we usually do, uh, we've also seen uh, this government use really... Uh, new tactics in order to avoid transparency in a number of ways. And just to give you some examples, you know, it, it is increasingly apparent that in the Senate estimates process, in some of the committee processes, the government is relying on either public interest uh, immunity or other reasons to deny FOIs out of that. And I realise that this is not something that solely happens with this government. But it is certainly one that's been exacerbated. Uh, and I've seen that um, over the last couple of years. I think that the uh, it's very clear uh, that the Right to Know Coalition has uh, better access to freedom of information requests um, on its list of uh, things to do. But I think the Australian public uh, demands and expects that there is that transparency. You know, just as we talk about the fourth estate having an important role um, to hold governments to account, we also have processes that are supposed to be holding governments to account too. Nikki Savage, should, should we as the public know what Barnaby did in that role? Uh, look, I think the more that we know about what government does and how government comes to its uh, decisions, the better off we'll all be. Um, they do need to be more accountable, they do need to be more transparent and uh, the only way really that we can avoid um, mistakes being made or uh, mistakes being perpetuated is if we know more about how uh, decisions are made and uh, I think um, they should be more open and uh, they should be more upfront with Australians about how they come to decisions. No, you're they? shaking your head, that's, Barnaby. And that's not going to happen. What you're asking for well, is, gov is government by Zoom conference, like where everybody no, can no, turn no, on the time. No. If, if every time I write a letter, I think someone else is going to read it, guess what? I'm going to stop writing your letters. You're going to send it on WhatsApp. Yeah, I'm just going to stop. Encrypted. I'll send it on Signal. <laughs> I'll send it on WhatsApp. <laughs> I'll send it on Telegraph. <laughs> but I'm not going to send them a letter. To be fair, though, you, earlier on in the program, you were sort of talking about privacy and the fact that uh, as a well, public figure, privacy. you were fair game, that we should ask as if, much if, as we want, we should know as much as we can. But we're living in a mythical world if we think that every piece of correspondence in the government is going to be up for public discussion because you're going to and fro. If it's going to be honest and succinct, you're, that's but, the way you're going to do but it. But there was no... If you final wanted. report deliverable as part yeah, of this role. I did give... I, there, there are reports, and I'm, there, are, there are absolutely are reports. I'm trying to work with if the final one was public, but I know that there was times I wrote pages in, within a report about exactly what was going on. But if everything you're suggesting in government is going to be there but, for but public... But this isn't everything. We're this is just a few specific things. OK, no. well, you agree with me. We're not suggesting everything. Well, that, Obviously, that, yeah. there are some discussions... Well, which one? ..and some papers that need to remain um, secret that Thank involve you. national okay. security. We agree on We're that. talking about drought funding. Well, We're talking about but, droughts. But, uh, We're not talking about terrorism. Well, if I'm going to have a direct conversation, an honest conversation, I think it's... But, but alternatively, I think it's going to be read. I'm going to sanitise it, or more to the point, I'm going to pick up the phone and ring them. Are you telling well, have a direct to the conversation with colourful? the Australian people as well. well. I, think it's, I don't think that's going to be surprising to anybody. <laughs> All right, our next question is a video from Nick Coxon in North Melbourne. Where should the line be drawn in comedy between causing significant offence or hurt and fair game for harmless laughter? 
How should this be navigated? Antoinette. Oh, look, this is a really interesting one. As somebody who grew up watching um, Eddie Murphy, um, Delirious and all the things and all the jokes that he makes then that I thought was hilarious as a, I don't know, 13-year-old, however old I was now, but in this context, I can see how it's incredibly um, inflammatory and offensive to some groups. I'm not particularly a fan of erasing history or um, cancelling um, Chris Lilly um, uh, for things or faulty towers or things that were produced um, in the past. I think, you know, comedy needs to push boundaries. It always has. I think we can be critical of current content and I think we, we're certainly in a different place in, in the use of the F word and the N word um, and, you know, context matters. We learn from hindsight things that were once acceptable are no longer acceptable now. Um, so it's interesting. We need comedians to make us kind of gasp um, and then laugh. I think that's an important role they play and we can't sanitise too much. Um, so I understand, yeah. So I guess my, my, my view, to summarise, would be don't cancel the past. We can learn from it. Um, don't punish people for a tweet they sent in 2007. Um, but certainly in this day and age, the, you know, the cultural, the political climate has changed and Michelle, politicians should Michelle, are there things that should be cancelled, do you think? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of cancel culture either. Um, but I also think this goes back to the answer I gave to the first question, which was media, including uh, what we see in terms of uh, comedy and what we see on our, on our screens and what we hear, this is supposed to reflect Australian um, character, our culture and our identity. And it does change over time. You wouldn't see Kingswood Country on um, TVs uh, these days. So we, we certainly have evolved, but I think we also need to respect that you know, we have a, a pretty high bar in Australia when it comes to free speech because we value our democracy. Yes, there are limits on it. There always have been, be they in uh, defamation or uh, codified uh, in the law, but we do set quite a high bar. And I think the tolerance level of Australians by and large is actually quite high. Uh, and we do push boundaries. Everyone from, uh, if we're talking comedy, everyone from Hannah Gatsby, um, you know, to people like um, Chris Lilly. Uh, so uh, I, I think, think that... I think self, like, there's a place to be self-deprecating de and Aussies are quite good at that. Um, I think when you're emulating other cultures, yeah. that's when it beca cause... can become quite problematic. Mm -hmm. If you are a sexually diverse person or a black person or an Arab talking about, you know, strict parents or Islam or whatever, poking fun, I think you've got more liberty there. Mm -hmm. If it's somebody else poking fun at another group, mm. I think that's where you get I into think, dangerous I think territory. Why, I think that's why Hannah Gatsby was so yeah. successful, yeah. Exactly. because here was a person uh, who um, identifies as she does, yes. um, allowing herself to be so exposed in a comedic way yes. at the same time. Australians are innovative, yeah. you know? Australians we are, we, actually do push the envelope and boundaries. We are going to wrap this up. I know you were trying to get in, Ziggy, so if you make a brief... Yeah, well, I, what I was just going to say is I think it, it ties so much into what your report has found. Like, it, it says that um, if it's not coming from the source, it's, it's going to be misrepresented. So I think an example of, like, Chris Lilly, he's, he's making jokes about a lived experience he hasn't had. Mm. So I think that's where it falls short. So in the same way that in our media we need culturally cultural diversity so people can speak on on their lived experience. Or make fun of their lived or experience. Or make fun of their... I think it it's the same thing with yeah. comedies. Like, yeah. if, you're, if you've lived that experience, you, can act, you actually understand the nuance and the humour within that rather than just the stereotype of that. All right. Uh, that's all we've got time for tonight. Ziggy's about to perform for us. That is your cue to uh, go and get set up. Uh, thanks to the rest of our panel, Barnaby Joyce, Michelle Rowland, Nikki Sava and Antoinette Latouf. Please put your hands together for the night. I'm going to clap you, Michelle. Uh, and thanks to those of you here and also at home for your questions tonight. Thanks for your company. Uh, thanks to those of you streaming us on iView tonight as well. Now, over the next fortnight, we'll bring you two special programs exploring both the young and the old. Next week, the young who are bearing the brunt of this crisis. Then we'll hear the wisdom of the years with a panel of respected elders. To take us out tonight, though, here's Ziggy Ramo and his band performing Stand For Something. You can feel my rage, yeah, I'm red hot. You either get my point 
or you get point blank shot. I ain't forgot. You see black lights is nuisance. Broke your own laws, suspended constitutions. I'm fueled by hate, strapped up ready for war. But mama told me love's the only thing we're fighting for. But I ain't felt hope in a long time. Black lives ain't make nothing in a long time. So um, hold up on your face, on your palate, how it tastes. Will it take another life to go to waste before you get up to date with the state? of inequality between race. It's not about black and white. It's about all humans getting basic human rights. So I, so I, so I, I swallow my pride and look you in the eyes, give you my time. You see, I, I stand for something. I stand for something. I stand for something. I stand for something. Knock, knock, I'm standing at your door like Jehovah Witness. See, I could be the greatest just like Hope is spitting. And I don't really care if you ain't ready to listen. Cause our people losing lives, forget the system. The government, they never really care about us. They stole our use, so now we're drowning in the fountain. And black voices never heard upon your TV. Black thoughts caught your ears, so now all of you people hear me. And how would say so many lights with gun laws? But I'm shooting holes like pool damn right, I save my black balls. Please, won't you Aborigines be polite, only white? Life's worth saving, and that ain't right. So stop it, this discussion is disgusting. My mind racing, next racist wrists I slit and have gushing. I'm locked in a cell, and my education means nothing. Even though they said sorry, it never changed nothing. Stand for something. I stand for something. I stand for something. I stand for something. Over half my peers more likely to see prison than to get an education. How's that life worth living? How's that life worth living? I stand for something. 